Welcome, folks. I want to thank you for joining us at the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Today's program features Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum. Would you please give her a hand? Hi. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here for my second appearance before the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Uh, my first was last year sometime, but I'll tell you, sometimes it seems like just yesterday and other times it seems like maybe about 10 years ago or so. Uh, but in any event, um, really appreciate that this organization um, exists, is so robust. Uh, you show up, hopefully you're having some good food and good conversation, and maybe want to know a little bit about what goes on at the Oregon Department of Justice. So first, I brought some things for you, um, our little brochures. Uh, I think these are very helpful, uh, perhaps to you, but in particular, take them to your families. Take them, especially if you have uh, particularly elderly folks in your family, uh, explain to them some of the things that they can do to help protect themselves uh, with respect to um, their you know, phone, with respect to door-to-door -door sales, with respect to the internet. Uh, it's wonderful that so many, especially of our seniors, are using the internet, but it also can be a little bit of a menace. Uh, and so here are some ways that you can, uh, even yourselves, reduce your telemarketing calls, your junk mail, and join our scam alert if you're not already signed up. Uh, this tells you how to do that. It's really easy. I actually did it the other night for my whole family. Uh, so all you have to do is just plunk in an email address and you'll start to get our alerts and we can keep you advised. Um, the, unfortunately, the latest in scams, uh, and um, there are many. So we want you to know about them. We want you to let your friends and neighbors and family know about them. And the second brochure that I passed out is called the Wise Giving Guide, also something that can be useful, especially at this time of year. Pretty soon we'll have, you, know, you all know that at the Department of Justice we supervise charities. And there are over 18,000 charities registered in Oregon. And uh, I just got that number hot off the press. It's actually something like eight, uh, 18,270. And so they're not all centered, headquartered here, of course, in Oregon, but they all do business in Oregon. They all have uh, registered to do business. And we will soon be coming out with our top 20 worst charities which sadly, uh, there's still a number, thankfully not so many anymore, that really give practically nothing of what they take in to the mission of the charity. And if, you know, when you, when you give your hard-earned money, whether it's $5 or a couple of thousand to a charity, you expect that a good percentage of that is going to be used for the mission of that charity, correct? Well, unfortunately, no requirement along those lines. And there's even a couple that are down in the 2%. That means 2% of what you give is used for the purpose of that charity. Now, the good news is they have to tell us how what percentage goes to the mission. And the even better news is that we have a brand new law as of this last, just went into effect in October, that if a charity that is registered in Oregon doesn't give at least 30%, and I realize that's still pretty low down there, but at least 30%, then they are essentially disqualified from being one of those charities for which you can receive a deduction. And therefore, hopefully people are going to be less inclined to want to give to that charity. And they also have to inform you. And if they don't inform you that they are unqualified, then they're in violation of the law. They're in violation of the Unlawful Trade Practices Act, and we can go after them for that. So we're hoping that by this new law, which, by the way, was a bipartisan law passed by our legislature this last session and is the first of its kind in the country, uh, that this is going to help to protect people from uh, giving to generous people who give but who really um, don't realize that the money they're giving is not going for that purpose. And mostly these are companies that, that hire these telemarketing firms and they pay them like 70% of what they bring in. So that's where that 30 comes from, right? Because 70 plus 30 is 100. Uh, so se if 70% is going to the fundraiser and the overhead costs, that's really not, even that's not adequate. Yes, Virginia. Uh, what are the uh, requirements for an organization to become a registered nonprofit in Oregon? Well, yeah. I registered the name before and it seemed like 
The bar is pretty low, and I'm not the expert. We have a charities division, and maybe we could bring Liz Grant in to speak to you to give you some of the more, more of the details. But they do have to provide information, including this information that I just referred to. They have to tell what percentage. There are certain uh, requirements, but I'm not going to be able to give you all the details. So anyway, um, I wanted to start out by just um, bragging a little bit and uh, helping to uh, ensure the, the financial safety of our citizens by providing some of this kinds of information. Ellen Clem, another Ellen, is our consumer outreach uh, coordinator. And she goes all over the state, particularly meeting with senior groups. And her card is in the bag that I provided. So if anybody wants to uh, get in touch with her directly, you're welcome to get uh, have her come in and speak with you, as well as perhaps somebody from our charity section. So I ran for attorney general last year. And I said that at the time that my goal was to be the people's attorney general. And I hope that by some of what I'm describing here today, you get the idea that that's really what I wanted to do. Um, so I wanted to do more than provide advice to the many state agencies that we serve, though with our 100 plus lawyers who ably represent state government, that is clearly a very important part, a critical part of what we do. Uh, but I also pledge to have the department look out for all Oregonians, and especially for the most vulnerable among us. Oregonians whose homes were in foreclosure, and I'm happy to report that we also were able to make some progress there. And we now finally do have an up and running mortgage foreclosure avoidance uh, mediation program that is working, that the banks have signed on to, and that are actually providing us with the names of the um, you know, prospective um, homeowners who may be foreclosed, and trying to, we are trying to help keep those people in their homes with this program that you may recall there was a law that passed the year before that didn't quite work out the way we'd hoped because it ended up applying only to non-judicial foreclosures and then the bank started filing for judicial foreclosure. So we're very happy that we're all on board together now to try to make this work and I think that we are going to be in better shape. Fortunately there are fewer foreclosures now because the economy has improved but there's still way too many and so we want to try to keep people in their homes to the best of our ability. So thank you to the banks for participating in that program and to our citizens because it actually is a two-way street. We now have to have the homeowners also agree to participate in these one-on-one -on -one mediations with the, the mortgage service providers. Um, so happy that we're able to uh, accomplish this program and it remains to be seen whether it will be successful but at least we have it on board and it's underway giving thousands of Oregonians an opportunity to stay in their homes. Um, we're also at work modernizing the state's child support system, which is run by the Department of Justice. How many of you knew that the Department of Justice has 12 offices in the state of Oregon that essentially provide child support services, including the collection of child support? Our auditor knew that. Aha, our lawyer knew that. Emily, fantastic. Well, did you, do you know how much we collect every day in Oregon in child support? Anybody want to take a gander? A million dollars. Who said that? You're right. How'd you know? All right, you must have been to one of my other speeches. Anyway, we do. We collect a million dollars every day in the state. However, uh, and this is you know, to feed and house and clothe our, our children. Yet our computers that we use to do this were built in the 1970s. It is a full employment act for senior citizens. We're the only ones who know how to run these computers because they run on COBOL, DOS, all those wonderful old programs. Um, so our, our software was last updated in the 1980s. But thanks to the support from the governor and the legislature, by the time my first term is over, and it's going to take a little while, we should have a brand new, fully operational, 21st century child support collection system in place. Yay! So the governor and the legislature came through. At this stage, we have approval of a $14.5 million capital bond sale to begin this process of conversion to a modernized system. Uh, so some of you knew, but very few realize what a huge part 
This is of the Department of Justice, and we work very closely with district attorney's offices to do this as well. We don't do it alone. 26 out of the 36 DA's offices assist us in the collection of child support. They are able to, they're allowed to opt in or opt out, and if they choose not to, then we do it all. Um, many of our employees, by the way, uh, we have, so 12 offices, it probably doesn't surprise you then that half of our 1,300 employees at the Department of Justice our work in the child support collection area. So that's half of, of our workforce. And some of, the, some of them have been with us for over 30 years, and they are, by the way, represented by SEIU, and I have regular meetings with the SEIU stewards and leaders to ensure that we're doing the best uh, job that we can in terms of, uh, of serving our, our workers. So a couple of other things that I wanted to share with you that I'm particularly proud of uh, as the, the leader of this rather large agency is uh, we recently successfully resisted an effort by the Big Tobacco to reduce the amount of Oregon's previous settlement with them to literally pennies on the dollar. And this ended up saving our general fund countless millions of dollars, at least eight or nine million dollars, and will provide much needed resources for the entire state. Uh, so I'm very proud of our civil enforcement division, which took the lead and recently won an, the arbitration that kept this money where it belonged, right here in the state of Oregon and not in the hands of Big Tobacco. So we're also protecting veterans as they return home from their uh, valiant and valuable service abroad. Uh, scams are, of course, despicable, but they couldn't be any worse than when they target veterans, so, as they recently did uh, at a certain um, holiday retirement. And I know that holidays trying to do better now, but we recently settled with them and gave money back to veterans who we believe had signed up for their programs under false pretenses. So just to give you a little bit more of a sense of the vastness of the work that we do in the area of consumer protection, our section receives 40,000 calls a year. We have 25 full-time volunteers in our Salem office who, uh, and when I say full-time, they don't work every day, but we have them every day uh, responding to the many calls that we get and then asking them to convert them into written complaints if they're something that can't be just resolved with a phone call. So we end up getting about 12,000 written complaints every year, and each and every one of them, those gets the attention of a volunteer, uh, potentially an investigator, and if need be, uh, an enforcement lawyer. Uh, so again, if you sign up for our scam alerts or you go online, you can make a complaint. Uh, and you can also look up, if you're thinking of doing business with a particular company and you don't feel like you know quite enough about them yet, particularly if they're online, you can go to something called Be Informed. It tells you about it in that brochure. And we have a, a pretty uh, extensive list of businesses and complaints. Any complaints that have been filed, it will tell you how many complaints there have been, and it will tell you how that complaint was resolved in a very you know, limit, you know, minimal way. We don't give a lot of detail, but it's, it's coded to let you know whether it was closed successfully and that sort of thing. So that you can, again, use this as a way to keep, keep safe and make decisions about who you're going to give, give your business to. Um, I haven't mentioned anything yet about our criminal justice work. It's actually, surprisingly, a small amount of our workforce, but it is the area that gets, uh, in addition to consumer protection, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, attention and recognition for the, the value that we provide to district attorneys. We assist DAs around the state with criminal prosecutions. We recently um, led one of the largest methamphetamine raids in Oregon history down in southern Oregon, where they're really in need of additional uh, law enforcement resources. Everybody's aware of the difficulties throughout the state, but in particular in our counties that were reliant on timber monies in the recent past and just simply do not have officers on the street just to make simple arrests, let alone conduct uh, sophisticated um, investigations that require, for example, possibly wiretaps and that sort of thing, and we're able to assist with that. We also have an active inter Internet Crimes Against Children program which I'm hoping to continue to expand with some additional resources, uh, with luck, uh, to, um, well, we don't have them yet, but we're working on it. Uh, we are hoping to expand into the area of, of tra unfortunately, we need to, in the area of sex trafficking and human trafficking, because that is a scourge on our communities that is pretty much still under the radar, but we are more and more learning of the extent 
of this problem. And that's something that we can do because we already have the capability with the Internet Crimes Against Children program. We have the expertise. We just need to be able to um, have some additional resources to be able to do that. So basically, those are some of the main things that we do. I haven't touched on every single uh, you know, area. Obviously, we have our law firm. Uh, we're the largest law firm in the state. Uh, we do general counsel. I mentioned the 100 plus lawyers who represent state agencies. But we also have a trial division and an appellate division. We handle every appeal, every criminal appeal in the state. Every case that gets appealed from a DA's offices where there's a conviction, we handle the appeal at either the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court or both. So actually that was part of what got me interested in this job because I used to be on the Court of Appeals. Some of you may know that. And so I saw lots of lawyers from the Department of Justice, brilliant lawyers, writing excellent briefs and arguing their cases. And I remember thinking, well, I know what the DOJ does because I've been a judge on the Court of Appeals. Well, that's just a very small part of what we do, but it's of obvious critical importance. So. What I want to tell you is that after one year, um, I'm loving this job. I thank you for helping me to get there. Uh, but we have a huge, huge amount to do. The learning curve is steep. And with limited resources, there's lots that I want to be able to do that I haven't yet even really been able to, to talk about too much because I fear that it will sound like I'm maybe asking for more than, than I can uh, you know, get. But, just to give you a little, just to close, I will tell you that there's a couple of areas that, you know, if I, in four years, were to look back and have some, I don't like the word legacy, but something to really show, something to be able to say the people of Oregon have benefited by my having served in this office, I would like to say in the area of consumer protection, if we can keep more of our seniors safe, so elder financial abuse, all other vulnerable communities safe, such as diverse communities where English is not the first language spoken and therefore those groups are much more uh, prone to being targeted. And thirdly, um, our young people, our students who are deeply in debt and who deserve a life at least as good as the one that many of us have been able to benefit by financially. Uh, those are the three areas that I most focused on in consumer protection. I've already mentioned that I'm hoping to expand in the area of, of the trafficking, the human trafficking that is such a scourge. And then my most recent foray uh, into kind of a new area that I think no one really, as I evaluate um, other state agencies and even advocacy groups, seems to be yet uh, owning, shall we say, is um, internet safety and privacy. And that will be, uh, stay tuned, because that will be uh, the next area that I hope to uh, uh, convene a symposium, work in the area of legislative uh, change, and certainly education and outreach. Because it is my belief that from the age of about maybe three all the way up to our senior citizens, we really don't understand what it is that we are uh, giving out when we sign on, whether it's, you know, typically these days on the internet. Uh, and I want people to be informed, and I want them to know and may be able to make choices. And I don't think that we're at that point in our uh, current level of knowledge and understanding about how the internet works, how the whole um, sort of the commerce of the internet works. And so that will be uh, also something that I'll be focusing on going forward in the very near future, maybe even as soon as this afternoon. Uh, because there's a re there is a, a settlement today with Google, that's a pretty big deal, and so that will be uh, that will be in the news. Basically, uh, Google's cookies. In fact, there's a picture of some chocolate chip cookies, which of course it's not the kind of cookies they're talking about, but it's a nice little. Um, I don't know where they came up with that term. Somebody here probably knows. In any event, uh, there is a settlement that basically requires Google to be more transparent with respect to um, those who have. Um, Safari um, on their computers and go through Safari to access Google, apparently there were some misrepresentations, pretty significant ones, that were made to, uh, to consumers of that, uh, of that uh, particular way of getting, getting online so, and, and doing business. So we will uh, 
stay tuned on that one. Uh, but there's just so much to be done. There's so much to do. There's, you know, as I said, 1,300 employees, nine divisions, and there's never a day that goes by when I don't just absolutely, um, you know, wonder at the great people that I have the opportunity to work with at the Department of Justice. Because if it weren't for that, I couldn't possibly be enjoying this job so much. <laughs> so thank you for having me, and I'd like to open it up to questions if you have any. I'm sure you do. Win. Um, could you uh, speak? Our program has to ask questions from the microphone if you remember. Hi, Ellen. Um, I just had a good friend who's a retired judge tell me they were abandoning their home phone because they couldn't stop the solicitations to their home phone and that the no-call list is not working at all in Oregon. The do not call? Or the, the yeah. The, yeah, the, I think we have, don't we have a lawsuit against Rachel of Card Services, at least one? And I know I get five or six calls on my home phone a day, and I'm sure others, especially seniors, do. Uh, what's going on with that, and is there any prosecution or any agreements with anybody to stop the calls? Right. Well, unfortunately, um, the Do Not Call Registry is run by the um, Federal Trade Commission. So I hate to pass the buck, but I'm going to, because it is, um, if you have a complaint about it, you have to file it with the FTC. And I am not up on exactly where they are in terms of uh, of lawsuits that have been brought to try to stop it. It's very, very difficult uh, to completely eliminate the calls. And in fact, they there are exceptions. So that, for example, charities are accepted from the do not call list. So you're not going to keep them from calling. You just want to be informed about whether it's a charity that you should be doing business with. Right. So I think it has been helpful. It has reduced the number of calls. But it's not really ultimately the solution. We have to be aware. We have to, you know, really question when we get a call whether or not we even want to answer the phone. And I think that's also something that we need to work with our senior citizens about. Is uh, I, you know, the more I go around and speak with groups, the more I I learn about. It's kind of wonderful how polite everybody is, especially Oregonians. We're very polite, so they we don't like to hang up on people. But you know what? Maybe the best thing is just not to answer the phone in the first place then. Because once you got on one of those calls, uh, there are, we had a scam jam. Was anyone able to come to the scam jam that we had last month in, uh, at the convention center? We had over 800 people attend and we taught this group, not only themselves, but we tried to teach them to teach others about how easy it is to be scammed. And one of the ways that we did that was we actually had some scammers who were talking about what they do, kind of the techniques they learn to kind of deal with, get, get under your skin to, uh, you know, to get you to respond to their emotional um, pitch. And it's really, really frightening. So the best thing is not, for, especially for our seniors, is to teach them not to, um, not to answer the phone in the first place uh, unless they know that they're expecting a call. I was very happy to come to your workshop you had recently on the human trafficking laws, and I wondered if you would, sh would share with everybody what that was about, what sure. the outcomes were, anything wonderful that's happened because of it. Right. Well, you know, there's some good news, uh, and it didn't really come out of that, but it was shortly thereafter. Um, we, the legislature has designated over $2 million for a, a trafficking shelter for, victim, for child victims of human trafficking. Kind of arose out of the grand bargain, believe it or not. <laughs> and so um, we did talk quite a bit at that meeting at the Oregon Bar Offices. We compared a uniform law that's been prepared, kind of a model uniform law on human trafficking with what Oregon has. And we had several legislators there who are very interested, in particular Representative Carolyn Tomei, Representative uh, Jennifer Williamson, both have this really on their, on their radar. So they, uh, they came and we compared with the Oregon law with the uniform law and kind of come up, came up with some ideas for maybe going forward for legislation. Uh, and we also talked about um, the need for uh, judges to be better informed, to be able to identify victims of trafficking. So maybe they're in a case that doesn't really in immediately call to mind a trafficking victim, maybe it's a, a DUI or maybe it's uh, you know some type of a juvenile case where that isn't necessarily even raised, 
but there are markers for identifying victims of human trafficking that judges are now being trained to, uh, to detect. And of course, it doesn't apply exclusively to judges, but that is just one area that we have conversation about. But I think most exciting is this uh, prospective uh, shelter, because if you don't have a shelter, if you don't have a place that young women, usually women, sometimes boys, can feel safe going when they have been victimized by these crimes, then not only can they not move forward in their lives, but we can't prosecute successfully. The, uh, the perpetrators. And so I'm really pleased that I think Oregon is going to be able to have a cutting edge uh, shelter. And in addition to the state funding, which is great, but isn't going to be enough to, to you know, finance it going forward, uh, Senator Ron Wyden is very interested in this. And uh, he is looking into uh, possibly some additional federal funds. So I think, again, stay tuned. But we are moving forward in this area. We actually have some pretty robust um, prosecutions going on in the Tri-County area. And again, it's an area where we can play a role outside of the Tri-County area, where it's just where resources are limited. And so we want to expand our inter internet crimes against children uh, focus and our expertise there to be able to work in this area. So thank you for coming. And um, you know, it was it was a really uh, it was a really good morning. I, I was glad we were able to get so many people. Chris Leslie, former member. Hi, Chris. Uh, with the uh, woman that was raped, I believe in Alabama, she uh, is seeking direct appeal. What is Oregon's position on direct appeal of victims by victims for a direct appeal? Do okay. you have any law like that in Oregon? I'm not sure that I'm f totally understanding what a you're asking, whether a appeal. victim can directly appeal rather than yes. a defendant appealing. We have, a, we have constitutional and statutory victims' rights here in Oregon. So victims there are, and some of those laws do apply to the appellate process. So the answer is, is sort of yes qualified, because victims can be involved in the appeals. The victim is not the direct, not the actual party, exclusive party to an appeal. But we do have laws in Oregon that are very favorable to victims of crime. 22 states have direct appeal by victims. Mm -hmm. What is your, do you still think the law is okay? Um, I will study exactly what our law is with respect to direct appeal. As I said, victims have a lot of rights in Oregon, and I'm totally in favor of those rights, and I'm even in favor of expanding those rights if we feel that in the appellate sphere they're not getting adequate uh, opportunity to be heard. Thank you. John Hutzler, forum member. Hi. Um, cannabis has been in the news a lot lately with the... Uh, yes. uh, legalization in a couple of states and the federal government's changes in its attitude toward enforcement. Um, and uh, here in Oregon, there was a, <clears throat> a ballot measure defeated a couple of years ago, the passage of the Dispensary Act to allow the dispensaries of, of uh, medical marijuana and now a, a new initiative. Um, I wonder if you could share your thoughts on, uh, on the new initiative and, and uh, its value, and um, and also your thoughts on the uh, sort of contrasting positions of Washington County and Multnomah County on the enforcement of marijuana laws. Okay, well I want to make sure that I understand which initiative you're referring to, because in the last legislative session there was actually a legislatively enacted law that a lot, that that essentially legalizes the dispensaries with respect to medical marijuana. Uh, obviously, we don't yet have, uh, and may not ever have, full uh, legalization of marijuana in Oregon. But that is an initiative that is moving forward. Is that what you're referring to, or are you referring to the dispensaries? Um, there's, I believe there are two. There's the there's an initiative to legalize. Correct. And the dispensaries have has been passed and will be implemented. Right. Right. There's, there's a rulemaking process undergoing right now, going on right now to implement the dispenser, the legalization of the dispensaries. And that should go into effect sometime early next year. I believe like February or March is the expected date for that to be finalized. If the initiative passes that legalizes marijuana, then obviously a lot of that work will already have been done with respect to the dispensaries. They would, it would just be broadened to include 
the non-medical, uh, the recreational as well as the medical use of marijuana. Um, there are a number of initiatives that our office, you should know, I didn't even mention this, but a big part of what we do uh, in addition to uh, our, our appellate work, it not only is the appeals themselves, but our appellate lawyers uh, prepare the ballot titles and the yes or no statements, yes and no statements, and the summaries for every ballot measure going forward. So when the, the measure is created, it comes to us and we have to figure out how to summarize it in 15 words or less. <laughs> Challenging. Um, at least as the, as the title, and then the summary is longer but still limited. So we've been doing that with respect to these various initiatives, and my understanding is there's also consideration being given by the legislature, by some legislators, to a legislatively proposed initiative uh, because of some concerns about the language of the initiatives that are currently going through the process. Uh, so that's uh, kind of where things are right now. I don't have a personal opinion uh, as to you know, my views on whether legalization is a good idea or not. I can tell you that I'll be pretty involved in it if it passes. <laughs> so to the extent that it creates more work for me. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, uh, it looks like it, it will be on the ballot more than likely. Uh, the question is how many measures will be on the ballot? How many different initiatives, sort of competing initiatives? And the second part of my question was your thoughts on, on the uh, uh, kind of contrasting approaches to enforcement of marijuana laws, uh, Washington County versus Multnomah County. Uh, right. <laughs> one is pretty vigorous and the other is... Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to be a little bit careful what I say because our office is actually involved in one of those uh, cases uh, as it's currently going through the courts. But I will say this, that, um, you know, just like there's differences in federal versus state, there's differences from county to county. Uh, you have, diff you know, elected DAs, elected county commissioners, elected leadership, and I'm very respectful of that. So I think I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks for the good questions. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, a forum member, and thank you for coming in today. Thank you for uh, A few years back, a friend of mine, a guy named by the name of Tim O'Donnell, was riding a bicycle on an organized bike ride and was hit and killed uh, by an automobile. It turns out the young woman that was driving uh, did not have a driver's license. She was from Idaho and her sister had rented the car for her to use. Uh, they didn't check her for drugs or alcohol and she ended up only getting fined $2,500 out of the deal. And that was it. Uh, I, in, in Portland, or in Portland quite a bit and even in our area out here, pedestrians are getting hit by cars and, uh, and uh, bicycle riders are getting hit by cars. The Transport Bicycle Transportation Alliance, after Tim died, took on a big thing to try to toughen up the laws, because clearly the laws you know, were not strong enough. A lot of the district attorneys were against what they were trying to propose, but anyway, uh, I was just curious as to what sort of transpired since then, and maybe if you, can, if you know about it, maybe uh, you could tell us what's going on in that area. I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you, but one of the values of coming to these kinds of forums is for me to be made aware of issues that perhaps there's a role for uh, for our office to get involved in, particularly if there's you know discrepancies around the state and how certain types of cases are being handled. So if I could get your your uh, information, Bill, right, I would be happy to follow up with you. Karen Bolin, four member. Of the 12,000 written complaints that you've received, do you have kind of a top three uh, as far as a pattern? What are the things that people are complaining about? I think I've read about it, but I'm curious if you can share, because um, I, I imagine people need to know uh, how to be a good consumer of whatever those complaints are. <clears throat> right, well thank you for asking. Um, there is a top 10, uh, and I'm gonna see if I can find it quickly. If I can't, I'll just kind of try to do it from. So my recollection was is that number one was cell phone plans. Free is not free, if anybody's wondering. They think they get a free phone, but they have a three-year contract, and they're surprised. Um, and then the second one I had heard was annuities. People are getting pounded with annuities, and they, don't, they, re, they get told one thing by the salesperson, they don't read their contract, they sign on the dotted line, and then they find out that there's a big surrender fee. So I had read that those were some of your top threes. I'll tell you, th those might well be, but the ones that um, I'm aware of as the top, and there is kind of a list of 10, and unfortunately mm -hmm. I don't have that full list here, but include telecommunications, telecommunications. is always right up at the top. Debt collectors Debt is collectors. always very close to the top. Mm -hmm. um, and automobile-related um, 
cases are very close to the top. Those are usually around the top three, and then the others just kind of you know, and that, go back and that's that's published on your website, correct? That it top is. 10? It is. And as I said, if you have a particular issue with a company, mm -hmm. then you can go to our Be Informed um, database right. and actually look up the particular company. But um, you know we. We have so many complaints that it is a little bit a hard to, well, it's actually 40,000 calls right. that then get called down to the written, the actual written complaints mm -hmm. are the 12,000. So, uh, yeah, they do tend to kind of break down into And is it more areas. or less from last year to this year? It, it, it's about, it, it's pretty consistent. The top, you know, three or four tend to kind of switch back and forth, but, you know, the bottom line is that uh, there are, you know, sort of classic areas of complaints that I think we're all pretty much aware of and want to keep a lookout for. So I imagine health insurance will be next, right? Oh boy. <laughs> don't, don't get me started or let's see, can we just change the subject? Uh, I ask a question. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, good morning, General. I'll good bet morning. you never thought you'd be called a general. <laughs> you know, I was called, my, my first name was Judge for 20 years, so General, what the heck, it's uh, kind of got a similar I'm, sound to I'm it. I'm Lee Coleman. I'm, for a member, back to marijuana. It, does the department have uh, ha, has the department adopted a policy on uh, states' rights versus the federal law in in contesting federal application of its law on marijuana? Well, so have you adopted a, a states' rights position? No, I haven't really needed to adopt a position at this point because um, it hasn't really been a, been I haven't been confronted directly with the question. But I will say this: um, uh, I'm thankful that, and I think especially my colleagues in Washington and Colorado are thankful that the United States Attorney General, um, Attorney General Holder. Uh, finally did actually come out with a statement uh, of his policy and of the U.S. policy because that was what everybody was waiting for and Washington and Colorado couldn't even begin to really move forward with their planning for implementation of their laws and of course everybody's watching them at this point to see you know how they're going to to set things up it's it's you know there's so many complexities that are involved when you do have the federal um, state inc inconsistency. So I'm watching it very closely along with everybody else and grateful that I have a little bit more time than they have in Washington and Colorado to, uh, to sort of make their, make their determinations. So again, I'm not trying to sidestep the question, but that is, I mean, that is, we have not developed a policy yet and I think it's, it would be premature to have done that. Harry Boudin, forum member, thanks for coming. Uh, political question for you. Um, you were elected, basically elected to this office in a, in a primary election in which 70% of the voters did not participate. 30% independents to 31% Republicans. And by the time we got to the general, you, you faced a, a write-in candidate. The, the real question is, I guess first one, would you have won that election if all the people of Oregon were able to, to vote in that primary election? <laughs> Absolutely. Here, absolutely. And by the way, my my opponent in the general election was no longer a write-in. He was on the ballot. That's so true. let's just be real clear about that. Okay. okay. Here's, here's a real question, though. We elect district attorneys to state on a nonpartisan basis. We elect sheriffs on a nonpartisan basis. The judiciary on a nonpartisan basis. Should your office be nonpartisan? That's the real question, I think. You know, that would be fine with me, but I actually really um, learned a lot and and enjoy, it's kind of, kind of maybe the wrong word, but I really did enjoy uh, kind of the party system in realizing that there are uh, kind of um, issues that are associated with party platform and you can, uh, you can either sign on to or not to those issues. But in my case, once you get the job, you're not a partisan any longer. You are the attorney general and you serve all the people of the state and I don't think it really matters a whole lot whether the whether the election was partisan or not, as long as you are serving the people, and that's why I start out by saying I I ran to be the attorney general for the people of the state, not the Democrats, 
not for Republicans. I was a nonpartisan judge for 22 years. I know what it means to be nonpartisan. I know what it means to be fair and impartial. And I also was a prosecutor, so I know what it means to be a pretty, you know, tough prosecutor when that's called for. And so I think that I, maybe I'm the wrong person for you to be asking that question of because I think that I have a very deep understanding and appreciation for the role of the Attorney General, mm -hmm. the role of judges. And I don't, at the bot end of the day, I don't think it really matters that much in my case. Now, if I were a, you know, a partisan office holder at this time in the sense that everything I'm doing is focused on being a Democrat because I ran as a Democrat, then maybe there'd be some you know, concern and maybe there should be some sort of a you know, campaign to, to change things. But as long as I'm Attorney General, I don't think you're going to feel the need to do that. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Good afternoon, Mark Freiburg, former member. You alluded to some of the financial problems in the rural counties, and I would add to that Columbia County just next door where the voters rejected a jail levy, raising the prospect that in a few months they'll only be able to incarcerate federally and state-funded prisoners. Is the state, in your opinion, as the top law enforcement official, going to have to move in and somehow massively subsidize or take over law enforcement in a number of counties in Oregon? Well, you know, there's a we recently did pass some legislation that would permit that at least, and uh, it is, I'm certainly hopeful that we're not going to have to do that. Um, but I'm glad that we have the ability in the event that it becomes necessary. And as I indicated, it's really my um, my job to reach out and assist to the extent possible. But the, at the end of the day, my resources are limited as well. And so, you know, as my uh, chief criminal. Uh, council puts it, you have to queue up for, you know, to be to be considered for us to handle your cases. And that's not really the way it should be. We should be able to be available if need be. And so, but, but you know, it's all about resources, and so it's our resources as well. Um, you know, if we have to step in, we're happy to do that as long as uh, the legislature is willing to help us out as well so that we can provide the, the quality of the assistance that's needed. Otherwise, it's not going to do anybody any good. Thank you. Chris has got the last question. Okay. Why always the last question? Uh huh. Because <laughs> uh, you're the best. Uh, no, thank you. We're for all ready for the again. last question. I'm just getting warmed up here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we cut you off. <laughs> no, um, no in relation to the F Hutton naturally. That's a joke. Oh, um, <laughs> E. F. Hutton, a broker that is in bad repute with. Democrats. Uh, my question, basically, uh, I got lost in your website on your 2012 campaign, and you had a lot of children's issues, child uh, violence and abuse, uh, child endangerment. Now, that's a very serious thing, but then how also you had liberalized laws on marijuana and don't they conflict each other when you're legalizing drugs doesn't that endanger children well first of all i didn't say anything about liberalizing laws on marijuana on my website i think what i said i think you misunderstood what i what i said on my website and that was that in terms of resources, I would make enforcement of possession of marijuana a low priority, something that most of our most of our district attorneys already are doing. Um, and other than that, the only thing I've said about marijuana as a as a position is that I support providing safe and legal access to marijuana, which is really the dispensary issue for medical marijuana holders. That's all I ever said during my campaign, sir. So I, I'm sorry if that was misunderstood. I, I stand corrected. No, but, I, but let I, me talk I, about kids for a minute, okay, and tell you what we are doing with respect to kids, okay? Because I already talked about internet crimes against children and, and human trafficking and child support. Uh, what I didn't talk about is the 50 lawyers that represent the Department of Human Services in uh, child abuse and neglect cases. Uh, we handle cases all around the state. We have offices in Portland, Salem, Eugene, and Medford with lawyers and paralegals and support staff who literally go to every courthouse in the state representing the caseworkers who work their tails off to try to ensure that our kids are, 
are safe and that they're, you know, if they can't with their, their families, that they are being protected in appropriate uh, temporary homes, and that at the end of the day, if they have to be removed permanently, that termination of parental rights cases go forward in a timely fashion, and that when they are appealed, because we handle the appeals as well, that the appeals stick because we've done a good job below. These are critical cases, and I think nobody could possibly disagree that that is a, a function of the Attorney General that we should all uh, support and provide the appropriate resources for. So those are just a few of the areas. Uh, certainly, I'm also interested in kids with respect to consumer protection. I'm working on areas such as advertising food to children, um, sugary, fatty foods, that uh, all you have to do is turn on the TV and you can see what uh, kids are watching and uh, then what they're in turn um, perhaps choosing to purchase at the store. Uh, there's so many ways in which we work to protect kids. Uh, as far as children and marijuana, I can tell you this, I am not an advocate for children or teenagers or anyone under the age of adulthood to use marijuana or to be exposed to marijuana and don't get the idea that that's something that I've ever supported. Your words were exactly low priority, I am corrected. Low priority for possession of marijuana, exactly, compared to possession of heroin, methamphetamine, other serious drugs, and those are the cases that I described earlier. Not only are we handling those, we just uh, recently arrested 30 individuals, middle level individuals in a Mexican drug, methamphetamine drug ring in Klamath Falls, and if we had additional resources, we could probably do seven or eight or nine of those a year. We just don't have the resources to be able to do more. So that's one of my highest priorities. If you read an article in the Klamath Falls, what's the newspaper? Herald. Herald, uh, about two weeks ago, you would see that that was the headline, that the Attorney General's priority is disrupting Mexican drug cartels that are trafficking uh, drugs such as methamphetamine and heroin and guns into our state and throughout our communities. Thank you for the question, because it gave me a chance to respond with some of the additional things that we're doing. Folks, if you'd like to... Oh, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Folks, if I could just uh, have you uh, deal with a departure from our decorum for a moment. What I'd like to do is yield uh, the program to Jody Weiser for Tax Fairness Oregon for about 60 seconds while we bring in a surprise for you. So, Jody, could you come up here? Please tell us what's on your mind. So what's on my mind is next Tuesday, our county commission is meeting in the evening at 6.30, and they're talking about what to do with gain share. Gain share is money that could be going to the AG's office or to all the schools in the state, and instead it's coming back almost all of it to Washington County. They, they're expecting $90 million over the next few years, and the meeting is about how it's going to be spent. One of their big priorities is the event center, which we voted, 70% of us voted against a few years ago. Instead of using the money for building schools for the kids, <coughs> the, uh, the employees that work at Intel and Genentech, which is why we're getting gain share money in the first place. And so um, if you're interested in knowing more, I have, I'd be happy to take your information and send you stuff, or you can go on the website for Washington County. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. I'd like to introduce Zachary Jarvis, who's going to come up here. And Zachary, could you come up here and stand here? <coughs> A.G. Rosenblum, could you come up, please? We have a presentation for you. I'd like to introduce Zachary Jarvis. Hi, Zachary. And he's got a certificate for you. And Zachary, could you walk uh, into the microphone and tell us what the certificate says? Certificate of Appreciation. Ellen F. Rosenblum has been awarded this most awesome award for your dedication to Oregon. Keep us proud of your civic duties. Zachary Bernella Jarvis, November 18, 2013. Oh, wow. I am totally honored, and I congratulate you for all the wonderful badges that you've already acquired, and really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Excellent. He's our new sergeant at arms, so be very wary. <laughs> All right. Folks, I'm going to conclude today's program. Please check our website for what's coming on next week. We have a last minute change, and the program that we had planned is going to be switched around. So, with that, I'm going to conclude today's forum, and thank you very much. Bye bye.